Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to In the Blender with Brandon and Madeline Hyman. And tonight we have our special guest, my none other than my brother, Roy, who's going to be talking about mental issues, um, mental health awareness, just whatever you guys want to know. We're asking um, if you don't mind putting your questions in the chat box and we will answer your questions as we go along. Um, but the way we're going to do it tonight is we're going to just turn the floor over to him so that he can just break down um, mental health issues. So again, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and um, we will go from there. We're going to start off by just having him tell us a little bit about um, who he is and his background and then we'll just roll on from there. So, um, Roy, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you, Putty and Brandon, for inviting me back. Um, uh, my name is Roy Payne. Uh, I have an extensive uh, background in the mental health field. Um, I'm pretty much. I've done it. I've done it every. I've done it all. Families, children, incarceration. Veterans, homeless, you name it, I've, I've pretty much uh, done it. I've been in the field ever since uh, 2003. I've worked in numerous uh, areas across the country. So right now, I'm currently working in the uh, Baltimore metro area. I've been in this area for five years, and I've done different things here also. Uh, let me start with my education background. Um, I hold a... <clears throat> A master's, master of arts in counseling psychology. I hold an MSW from Boston College in uh, mental health. And I'm also a licensed master's social worker. And I've been licensed since 2014. Uh, currently I'm employed in the uh, realm of helping homeless veterans uh, in different, the different capacities. So tonight I wanna just, um, start out by you know making us aware of what mental health is mental health is a very broad topic is so much to it so tonight i'm just going to give you like a little bit of an introduction that i mean it would be i would be on here forever to get really in depth with it and uh you know to all the stuff that you know i've learned over the years the first question i want to say is um what exactly is mental health Mental health includes many uh, many different things. It begins where uh, a di disruption in the psychological, um, emotional, social well-being of any human being. That means there's a disruption, disruption in, their, in, the in their normal, uh, what is called baseline. Baseline is normal, it's a medical term. So it's any dis disruption from a person's baseline. Um, then it says, you know, why is there such a stigma? In it. There's many concerns surrounding mental health. Um, people are always concerned about mental health, especially what uh, we're going through right now in the world. The, but also, there's so many misunderstandings. People are miseducated about um, mental health. So many cultures are ignorant and uh, misinformed. These are things that can lead to discrimination. And also, the worst thing can happen is a person being labeled. You should never look at a person because of the way they are acting and say, oh, he's bipolar. If you do that to a child, labeling a person can hamper them because then they will start to question themselves. That's why it's only uh, it's best for a professional to uh, diagnose someone. We don't call them labels. We call them diagnoses. So when a person says, oh, this person is bipolar, oh, this person is this, oh, this person is crazy, you shouldn't do that because... It can do more harm than it can do help, especially a child, because children are very uh, impressionable. Um, you know, so you do that. Um, so how do we start a conversation about mental health? There's many ways you can start a conversation about mental health. Um, first, it begins with the therapist. The therapist can initiate uh, the conversation. Uh, the most important, the place is where the conversation takes place. It's important that when you take a, when you have a conversation regarding mental health, you want to be in a safe space. 
which is in the side of professional's office. You don't want to have a conversation about mental health around family members, around friends in a congregation or a social gathering, because for someone to come to you and say, I have an issue, that's, uh, that's hard in itself. And then to have the impact of people around you to judge you because you're actually asking for help, that'll do more harm. That can cause suicide, that can cause a person to withdraw, uh, that can ca cause a person to have de depression. So you want to be careful when you decide to say that about a person. You know what I mean? You don't want to put that label on them because you because if you do that in the wrong space, you can also cause them to like withdraw. And once they're withdrawn, it's very hard to get them open up again. So you want to be very, very careful about where the conversation happens. And also when the therapist begins working with a individual regarding a mental health issue, they build a rapport. It's called a therapeutic relationship. So during a therapeutic relationship, there's specific questions that a therapist asks. And those questions are based on the reaction of the individual because you're trying to build a therapeutic relationship. Some therapeutic relationships are difficult to make. Although a person has come into your door and say they want help or they're ready, once you start asking them the questions, it's going to be something that's abnormal. It's not normal for a therapist to like ask you about your business because the questions are deep. You know what I mean? You know, the old saying was therapists are disruptors. We come into a family um, structure and we disrupt that structure so we can bring it back to the baseline, to the normality. And in that structure, there's going to be, you know, we're going to rust some feathers because you're going to have to like disclose some valuable information that you haven't disclosed to anybody. But in order to get the help that you want or the help that you seek, you're going to have to disclose those very hard things. So, you know, that, that can be, that can be, that can be difficult. Mm -hmm. So then you want to say, um, what are the five signs of mental health? Um, that's, um, that can be very, you know, that can be, that can be, mental illness can be different. It can manifest in many different things. Okay. It can be energy levels. It could be a person can be hungry and, and not eat or a person cannot eat. A, per a person can withdraw, especially from their loved ones that are close to them. They can withdraw from their loved ones and then have conversations, normal conversations with strangers. And some people will get mad and say, oh, you, 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 can, you can't talk to us, but you can go out there and talk to them. It's a part of the withdrawal. It's a part of what the mental illness does. You know what I mean? Because when you look at a, a, a mental illness, it manifests as different things. It's like you could look at a person and say, oh, they're bipolar. Each and every human being has a characteristic of a mental disorder. Everybody, we all carry that every day. But in order to be diagnosed with that mental disorder, you got to have the other characteristics. And then there's other things that are involved. It's, it's, a, whole, it's a whole different dynamic. You know what I mean? We could talk about something. Uh, we, can, we could have a conversation and we could talk about me, 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 me. That doesn't mean I'm narcissistic. It's just that at that present time during that conversation, it's about me. But the first thing people say, oh, he's narcissistic. No, you can't do that. That's, that's putting a label on the person because there's a lot of things that goes with a, narciss a narcissistic person. So, you know what I mean? There's a whole breakdown to them. You know what I mean? And then, you know, um, even when you have um, diagnoses that are more than likely found in females, which is the borderlines, borderline personality disorder is mostly found in fe females. Eating disorders are mostly found in female, but you can't go and to this female and, and say, put a label on her and say, oh, she's borderline because she's a woman. You can't do that. You got to cross out all the other things because there's there's a thing that you know is in the prison systems and I learned this when I was a therapist in the prison system is that men in prison are female borderlines 
because some some behaviors that men do when they're incarcerated mimic female behavior. Like I found that in prison, men are uh, gossipers. Some of them are more than women, but that doesn't mean that they're borderlines. Um, there's a lot of cutters. Most borderlines and, and bipolars, they're cutters. They're the ones that are cut themselves up, suicide. But you can't put that label on them just because they cut us. You can say all of a sudden they're borderline or they're bipolar. You can't you can't do that. You gotta like go underneath and do all the other things. So you know what I mean? You you gotta pull like a you gotta do like a an assessment. You gotta dig deep and find out why. Because why they're doing it might not have nothing to do with the disorder. It might have everything to do with what's going on with them now. You know what I mean, and, and what they and what's the, and what's going on with them can manifest later on. I mean, you know, you can have something that happened two weeks ago, but it not manifest until two or three months later. So you can't just just walk to somebody and say, "Oh, this is what it is." No, you you you, you can't do that. You know what I mean? So you got to think about that. You got to look at all the signs that you know where it comes from. Because what I've learned also by from living in many geographical locations in the United States and spending time outside this country is that every environment puts pressure on a person or the person that is living in that environment reacts differently. You know what I mean? It's like one thing, like when I went, to, when I moved from Maryland to Massachusetts, I thought all... African Americans in the Boston metro area were like um, African Americans down the south. They're totally different. They look like me, but they they act different. Their values, their thought process is totally. It's a totally different dynamic. So you you can't say that. It's like me. I was born and raised in the country, but now I live in the city. When I first came to the city, it was a culture shock to me. But then, from living and, and traveling. I've learned how to adapt to the to the position where I am. Like moving back home from Boston back to Baltimore, I had to readjust again because we left 20 years ago. So those um, psychosocial issues, those play a, a big role in how a person responds. It's like back when I was in school, we used to use, I, I graduated from college using the DSM-4. TR. Now to the diagnose, they use the DSM-5, which a lot of stuff they took out. But with me, I still sometimes use things from the DSM-4 TR. And because even though the DSM-5 things are changed, you know what I mean? I have these conversations with my colleagues and I'm like, this is what this is. And they're like, no, this, no, just because the DSM-5 say it is, it doesn't, it's not an absolute. The DSM is not an absolute. What it is, is it's a bunch of people that got together and they figure out what these things are that you can diagnose with person with. But it's not a concrete thing. Some people might um, display a certain personality disorder at a certain time in their life. And then as they get older, some people grow out of it. Like uh, most of your... Um, people that's incarcerated, they have what they call is a uh, antisocial personality disorder, right? But if you are below the ages of 18, it's called conduct disorder. Even though that individual as uh, is displaying the behaviors of an adult, like he's committing adult crimes, he's having promiscuous um, sex. He has no regards for the law, which is some of the characteristics of an antisocial personality. But you can't call him an antisocial social personality person. You cannot diagnose that until they're 18 years old or more. You can't do that because between that time that person is 15 until they turn 18, they can grow out of it. And if you and you diagnose a child, well, even though he's 15 and and he what he's done because the laws now say we can. Um, we can try you as an adult at a certain age. And in Massachusetts, as 14 years old, you can be tried as an adult. You can go to an adult prison at the ages of 14. Yes, I had an individual that I dealt with. 
You cannot diagnose them still. Even though they're an adult population, adult institution, you cannot diagnose them as with an adult diagnosis. You can't. You have to di diagnose them until they're the age of 18. So you know, that's how, how important is it, um, not, not to cut you off, but just listen to what you're saying, with, with that information, yeah. how important is it to get um, a second opinion? It's not. It's, it's 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 simple to get a second opinion, but 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 with that, okay. The thing here's the thing with that. When you're incarcerated, I'm just saying. Always, I'm just saying in general, not not. Oh, in general, general you in can general. always you can always get a second opinion. Always, you can always get a second opinion. You know what I mean? But anti most antisocial personality disorders, they're in the prison system. So you don't have no rights. What rights do you have? If you're incarcerated, you're doing a lot of you're doing you're doing a football number. You can't say, "Hey, I want a second opinion," because <laughs> your rights are revoked because the, the state had, or the federal system has said, "Okay, we provided you with health." You know what I mean? Let me just uh, cue you in on something what a lot of people don't don't know. As a inmate incarcerated individual, there's two things that the state and the federal system has to provide you with. One, they have to provide you with fresh air. Two, they have to provide medical care. Those are the two things that they cannot deny you of. So, Say that one more time. Say that one more time. There's two things when mm -hmm. you are incarcerated that they cannot deny you of. One, they have to provide fresh air. Two, they cannot deny you medical attention. They cannot. They cannot deny your medical attention. Detention. Well, that, that, and, and when we, and when we and there, there, there's a situation that I can explain, but I can't disclose it because of where I am. But there's there's situations that I've seen. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot. Can, can you share how um, a person can go about finding the right therapist? How can a person go about finding the right therapist? You you look in the um, you look in the directory, look online, and you um, look at their credentials. Most therapists advertise their credentials, and they advertise their credential. LinkedIn is a big is a big right now, where people look at. You can look on LinkedIn. You can look anywhere. To find the right match. So, 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 so with finding the right match, mm -hmm. what are some of the things they should be looking for? Um, if you are a female that has been sexually assaulted, rape, or something like that, you would want a female. You wouldn't want to go to a male therapist because that might trigger you in the office. I've, I've dealt with that, you know, so you don't want to go and uh, deal with a, 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 a male therapist. You know what I mean? Everybody, well, you know, most African-American kids, what they want, and that was one of the things that got me involved with this is that they want minority male therapists. They're very rare. They're, they're very rare. And, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I, my next question to you was, what what piqued your interest, or what kind of pushed you in that direction? Okay, what pushed me in that direction? Okay, when I got out of when I got out of undergrad, when I got my bachelor's, I, I wanted to, you know I got a job. I got a job at a um, at a at a um, place that was a, a vendor, but they were the, they were the vendor of the Massachusetts Department of Youth Services. So I was working with youth offenders. I was I was working with kids that were like done misdemeanors or you know rev uh, caught, you know revoked or you know probation you know, or whatever. So I was working in there, and one day I was you know I had one of my Spanish kids. He was a client, and he looked at me. And he said, "We need more people like you." I didn't catch on what he said. And then I caught on what he said. What he said was, "We need more people like you," meaning an African American male to be a therapist. Because at that time, the therapists for the 
uh, institution that I was working at, she was Caucasian. So that right there, I was like, okay, I saw that. So that that then and then I left that institution, and then I got transferred to an all girls uh, juvenile um, facility, and that was a piece of work in itself. <laughs> So then I left there. Then I started working with the serious dudes. Like what, what they what they call them? Massachusetts. They call them YOs. That's the next name. But they youth defenders. So what are the dudes that's done like serious crimes? But they are juveniles, murder, anything you anything that an adult does, they've done it. But they're under the ages of eighteen. So I worked with them for like two or three years. So Did you, you know. see, was there was there a huge um, difference in that? Diagnosing when it related to um, a Caucasian therapist and an African American therapist. That I can't speak upon because you know I never I, I never you know, but it's a difference between um, having a male and a female therapist. Got you. Okay. I, I just asked that question, you know, That's, based on the cultural differences. Well, you know, you know but but I, but I understand, I understand your position in that. Okay, but I tell you what, I'm going to answer that question later, a little bit later. Yeah, hold that question right there. We, we're going to come back to that. All right, we, we, we're going we're going to go back to that. But you know that that's that's where we are right there. The next thing, you know, uh, is mental health a big hot problem area? For children and adults, yes, it is. It's a big difference. Why? Because children have a higher suicide rate, a suicide rate than adults. Why? Because a, a, a child is still growing. You know what I mean? A lot of adults get set in their ways. A child is still growing. A child is still changing. A child is still dealing with the pressures of uh, peer pressure, which is the biggest thing. They're dealing with changes. You know, you got a child that comes to school. He might not can afford what the next person has. So you know, th there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, pressure behind that with a, with a child. So you know, they they do that. You know what I mean? And right now, the biggest influence is social media. Oh, I was going to ask you that question. Social Wait. media. Social media has triggered a lot of things among kids. You know what I mean? You know, you don't get no likes. You're not. On Instagram, ain't nobody you know touching you. Facebook, Snapchat, those are some of the ones that I, that I know. I don't know them all, mm -hmm. but I, I know about um, I know about Twitter. I mean, because you know when the kids said they wanted to get on Twitter, you know, Cindy and I, we followed them when they were kids. You know what I mean? And then after that, I just let my Twitter account go when they became adults. You know what I mean? Um, it wasn't until like a, about a month ago, for professional reasons, I became a member of uh, Instagram. I didn't even know what it was. I had to have my kids to set it up for me. You know what I mean? But yeah, social media has done a lot. Done a, it has a, it's a big impact on these kids because, you know, a lot of them don't go to their parents. A lot of parents are not allowed to follow them and they get involved with things. Those are where those um, sexual predators, that's where they get a lot of kids from, you know, and sex trafficking. That's another big thing. So, you know, you, you, you got that to deal with. But definitely, um, it's, a, it's a big difference. Big difference. And it wasn't until I went to my second master's, when I really got it deep into it, you know, I learned that the brain takes 25 years to develop. So to me, how can you lock up an 18-year-old kid when he's still a kid? Just because you turn, you know, most people, even we did it. When we turned 18, we thought we was the man. We was the woman. Now I'm an adult. You can't tell me what to do. I'll do whatever. But in actuality, you're 18. You're still developing. Because at 18, now you're treated like an adult. You're not really ready to understand the laws that govern this, this state. Like, like a like a like a kid don't understand that there's five commonwealth states. What is the difference between a commonwealth state and a regular state? A child don't know that. You know what I mean? Or they can go across state lines, they can do a crime, then they realize that they don't understand that's a federal crime because you went across state lines. But because you're still young. So 
just because you turn 18, you're not really an adult. You got 18, 19 year old people that get married, you know, when they're young, think they're young. Then when they get, you know, older, like late 20s or whatever, a lot of relationships, they grow away apart. They go apart. One person grows one way, one person goes this way. Some people stay the same because the, the, the brain is still developing. You know what I mean? So there's a um there's a big there's a big difference. Big, big difference. I have a quick um, question though for you before you yes. go on. What is because I know a lot of people have asked this, what is the difference in a mental health issue and uh, mental health illness? Okay, mental health issue. A mental health issue is like a mental health issue is uh let me give you a characteristic of bipolar. Most bipolar people, they would they uh they'll jump up one day and say, I'm gonna go to New York out of the blue. Jump in their car, just go to New York. No explanation, no money in their pocket, anything. A bipolar person will do that. Okay, that's a that's a mental health issue. That's a manic episode. That's an issue. Hmm. Okay. A mental health ish, a mental health illness is when you do it every day. It becomes a part of your life. It's like you see it all the time. Mm-hmm. You understand what I'm saying? And let me just give you something. Okay, like when I was talking about the DSM four TR, which I learned, right? Mm-hmm. The DSM four TR had five axes. Okay, so the first axis was the the it's how I, this is how I learned it. I learned it that the the, the DSM is the first is the is the um first set of disorders. Those are the disorders like bipolar and all those. Axis two is personality disorders. Axis two are the disorders that we don't say we're not. We, I'm not bipolar. I'm not antisocial. I'm not um I'm not borderline or I'm not histrionic. Okay, you're not that. But I can see it. Axis one is the uh, is the ones that you know you are. You know what I mean. You know you you know you uh you know you you know you um you know you have an issue, and you know it. You can see it. And you know something is wrong with you. That's the difference between the two. You see what I'm saying? It, it's kind of like. That's the, that's what that's what the difference is. That's good. You see what I'm saying? So is depression a form of a mental health issue? Depression depends on what it is because you got major depression. So it could be both. It could be both, but it it guys goes by the duration of how long yes. it is. In order for it to be um, majorly depressed, it's got to be at least a year. You got to show the characteristics for one year to be major. Anything less than that, it it could be acute stress disorder. So all different other types of things. What if it's seasonal? Some people have those, but it's it's not seasonal. That's that's a normal. Hmm. You know what I mean? That could be that that's 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 a that's a um unspecified because it really has no diagnosis. That's, that's what you do when you when something is not really meeting the um criteria for the diagnosis for the for the disorder, it's unspecified because right now I don't know what it is. Yeah, I I, I when I when I say seasonal, yeah, I know like like um for years I dealt with the issue where every year around a certain month. Uh-huh. I just got in this deep slump. Yep. And about three or four months later, I was out. Yep. But it was every year mm-hmm. it happened for at least 15 years. Right. You know, but once I recognize it, because you experience stuff sometimes you don't really recognize what's going on. True. And I took the time to really like, okay. Why is it every, I just one day just like, why am I doing this every year around this time? Okay. And I started associating some events that transpired that kind of linked to what I was dealing with. Right. So that's why I was asking about the seasonal thing. 
Mm -hmm. But there is a diagnosis. Um, they call it. I can't. I can't think it off the top of my head. But I learned about it um, when I was dealing with the veterans a couple, about three or four years ago. There, I can't think of the disorder off the top of my head. But the disorder. Oh, it's called sundowning. Right. Mm. When it's when it's in the evening, they will become very uh, agitated. They will they will their mood will change every day at sundown. It's called sundowning. I learned about it when I had a veteran about two or three years ago in the hospital. I was lost because I never saw it before. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, I learned that it's called sundowning. So. At, at in the evening time, when it's when when it, when it became in the, in the evening, we other than him giving him food, we didn't have. I, I had no appointments to meet with, him, although I was gone. But if I stayed there late, I didn't. We tried to restrict him from visits at that time because of the way he would be. It's called sundowning. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. You know what I mean. Like I told you, man, I pretty much seen it all. You know, sometimes I got to think back real hard because I haven't seen it in a while, but. Do, do you see a um, an increase in the need for uh, mental health awareness during this time or is has it been kind of consistent? Um... I can only refer to what I'm dealing with right now and what are the things that I see in the media. Uh, there's been an in increase in crime because of the job situation. You know what I mean? Let me break it down to you a little bit to where you understand it. Each theater, what I mean by theater, each situation will promote the other, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example. So, if you're homeless, right? So you're homeless. So now you don't have no food, clothing, and shelter, which, excuse me, is which is like the, the, the first stage of the Pavlov's pyramid, which means that, okay, if you don't have food, clothing, and shelter, that's the basic needs. That's the basic human needs. So if you don't have those, you're going to go do what? You're going to go get them by any means necessary, mm -hmm. right? So you're gonna gonna go to a shelter, but a shelter's not gonna provide you with money. They might try to provide, provide food for you and other stuff like that. But you're gonna start get these things. And then what you're gonna do? You're gonna go out. You're gonna commit a crime, right? Then when you commit a crime, you're gonna get incarcerated. So, so the homeless population deals with the criminal justice system, right? Okay, now hold on a second. Now let me connect it. So now you now you're incarcerated. So. When you get out, you ain't got nowhere to stay. Family don't want you. You're a criminal. You know, you got to do your own thing, blah, blah, blah. You know? So now you get kicked back on the street. Where you going to go? Back to the homeless population. You see what I'm saying? It's, 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 it's a revolving door. And they all connect with each other. The criminal justice system. So then when you get kicked back out, you get, de you get depressed. Right? Then what you want to do? You want to go and uh, deal with this. I, I can't deal with this. So when a person can't deal with something, they do what? They turn to drugs and alcohol. So when you do drugs and alcohol, then now you got to go to where? A sober house. You got to go to inpatient um, to therapy, to detox. You see, you see how all the systems depend on uh, each every every all the all the systems depend on each other. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So then when you have an alcoholic issue, right, a substance abuse issue, if you do domestic violence in front of a child, what happens? Then you get Child Protective Services involved. They come remove the child from the house. Then you got to go to court and fight for it. You can't get it. So what happened to the child? The child goes to foster care. Foster care is a 50-50 roll of the dice. Been, I, been, I, I worked with that too. So... Go to foster care. What happens to foster care? Child can get abused sexually, physically, emotionally. And then the child is traumatized because he's removed from his habitat 
his daily routine. That can trigger the child to do what? Act out. So the child can say, if you don't want to put me back in my house, then I'm going to go out and do something drastic. They can go out and get on drugs because they're depressed. Because at the age they are, they're not capable of being able to handle society, the pressures of society. So then they get incarcerated. So then they're in that system. You see how the system goes? It, the system goes like that. So what I did, I worked in every last one of them because I wanted to find out why they came to this. And then I started seeing some of the same things. So mm -hmm. I worked in all of them. I can, I can, I can, I can break it down from, from school. All I, I, I can, I can do that. You know what I mean? But that's that's mental health. Mental health is at all stages. And then once they come become an adult, an adult gets set in their ways. You know what I mean? And then let me just go back with this with, with children. Schizophrenia. We call schizophrenia the freshman diagnosis. Why? Schizophrenia usually manifests between the ages of 19 and 25. Hmm. At 19 years old, you're most likely in college. So I call it a freshman. Yes, schizophrenia manifests between nine, ages of 19 and 25. Are there any... Um, we have a question. Too. Go ahead. Are there, any, are there any cases that go undiagnosed? No case goes undiagnosed. But if you can't, because if the if the person is like showing these things, you got to call it unspecified. Okay, okay. You know what I mean, because what you do is when you diagnose it, you got to rule things out. This person's not antisocial because he's not doing this. You got to rule it out. You know what I mean? And then if you keep ruling it out, you're like, it's unspecified because it's showing characteristics of other. Keep in mind what I said mm -hmm. earlier. Every human being shows a sign of a diagnosis, but it doesn't mean that they're 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 that diagnosis. Gotcha. That could be just for the moment. You know what I mean? Hey, what what um are there any that you've seen that have just from just from an industry or or field standpoint, mm -hmm. are there any diagnosis that you've seen that are usually misdiagnosed? Uh, or is that something kind of touching? It's just like anything. Nobody, There's no perfect science. Gotcha. Does that answer your question? It does. Okay. <laughs> there's no perfect science. Put it that way. There's no perfect science. You know what I mean? Doctors make mistakes in operating rooms too. Yeah. Okay. There's no perfect science. It does. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and I'm glad I'm glad you said that because yep. uh, you know it's important for people to understand that everything is in 100. percent It's not, and just like I told you, in a child, you got to be careful when you diagnose a child because they're in a, they're growing, they're changing, mm -hmm. they're at different stages of their life. All right. The first thing a child learns from the ages of an infancy till they're about two years old is they learn to trust and mistrust, right? So if a child becomes a teenager and never learned how to trust someone from birth, they're going to have trust issues for, the, for a long time. So when they go to therapy, you're going to have to go all the way back to till they're zero to two years old, and you're going to have to learn about trust and mistrust. Trust and mistrust is the first thing we learn as an infant. We learn trust and mistrust by who changes our diaper, who gives us the bottle, who soothes us when we cry, who holds us when we cry, who keeps us warm, who um, um, souls us when we want to come and we're afraid at night of the boogeyman. That's where we get the trust and mistrust from. If we don't get that, if you neglect a child at that age, the child's going to have problems with trust and mistrust because then when they get older, they're going to be like, you know how it is. What are you going to do for me? You never did anything for me. You know, that's the first thing that's going to come because they have no trust. Mm -hmm. They're going to they're gonna learn trust and mistrust from somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that can tell you about why certain people get involved with sex trafficking. Mm 
because if they never had a person to depend to depend on, they get these people in text trafficking. They got this money. They say, oh, you know, I'll buy you this. I'll do that. They start doing things that they never had. You know what I mean? I've dealt with those um, when I was in prison. Those guys are very smart. They know all the dynamics of pretty much. Hmm. So, you know. <laughs> this, this, this is... Um, this, uh-huh. this is... It's it's just so much, man. It's like it's like going to an all you can eat. <laughs> yeah, and, and you got all this food on the table because yep. the information that you're sharing, yeah, is is mind blowing. I mean, really, because it is. So many people are are either directly or indirectly affected by this dynamic. Yep. Let me give you something. I'm I'm, I'm going to try to do my best because. I'm bound by the social work ethics and confidentiality. I'm going to tell you something, but I'm going to be very discreet about what I say. I was working in a place with a child, right? And this child was having a uh, episode. I want to say this child was between the ages of six and 10, right? The child was emotionally abused, sexually abused, and he had been burnt with cigarettes by one of the parents. So the child was having an episode and where he was in something called a, what we got is a quiet room. Quiet room is where you got to go in, you got to calm him down, stuff like that, blah, blah, blah. In the midst of trying to... um. I wasn't in the room directly because there was two of my female colleagues in the room with him, but I was at the window at that time observing. And this kid stuck his hands in his pants, defecated in his hand, and rust smeared it all over his body. Wow. Okay. And mind you, you can't touch that child because you don't know what's in his feces. So you got to go, you got to don on a suit, and then you got to go back in and handle it. So that is the effects of interrupting a child's development. So that's a child that's growing up in a house that gets, that's when you got to be very careful what you expose your child to when they're growing up. Now, when, when 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 you and I growing up, we didn't know all this. So we thought a lot of things that were normal, like we know, like the things that we seen growing up, we thought they were normal, they were abnormal. Mm-hmm. So when I became a professional, I saw that stuff. So, Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because... because I- People don't understand that some things you've seen growing up really wasn't normal. You had questions about it, but you didn't really understand. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Like me now, the, the oh my God. What I know now, <laughs> you know what I mean? What I know now, you know, and, and I hear it from certain family members. Oh, you think your kids are better than us? No, it's not about that. It's now I know the difference. Mm-hmm. My, my grandmother, bless her heart, she raised me. She told me, when you know better, you do better. Yep. Okay. She told me that growing up, she said, son, you, you know, when you know better, you do better. So when I had my kids, my kids got to see me go to college and, and earn my degrees and walk and stuff like that. But when I went and learned stuff that, okay, I said to myself, I'm not going to expose my kids to this. It's mess. But I had family members that would say, why you can't put your kids in public school? You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because some people get into this legacy of passing down information. Misinformed people, misinformed people. Mm. Yeah, you can say that again. (laughs) Misinformed people, misinformed people. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? 
let 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 you know, let's 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 be real about that. So I have a whole different mindset than what I had when I was growing up. You know what I mean? And I and I I came into this field because I wanted to make a difference. When that kid said that we need more people like you, I took that kid seriously. And after and after undergrad, I did not want to go back to college. I did not. But what he said moved me so much. I went back to school another five years to get two masters to do what I do now. Now, do do you are do you? Okay, let me get my question right. Do you do private practice? <laughs> uh that's in the process. Okay, okay. But if someone asks me, I will. Okay. Now that, that's that's good to know because I mean for some people, you know, some people may they just want to stick in, you know, that arena and don't want to do private. Well, I'm not going to say that I don't want to do private. I'm going to be I'm going I'm going I'm going I'm going to be honest with you, Brandon. I'm at a stage in my life where um it's about me and my wife right now. When I was boxing, I spent so much time away, excuse me, from them, and I moved across the country from everything. And, and now you know, it's about I don't want nothing to interrupt my time. <laughs> gotcha. I don't I'm serious. I don't want I don't want nothing to interrupt my time. If I choose to look at my wife and say, Hey baby, let's do this, let's jump on a plane, do this. I don't have to worry about no babysitter now. I can do that. So I don't want anything to hold me up. And having your own practice, most people that have their own practices, because I know a lot of people that I've met. Um, you no, know, that's what they do. They grind on it because it's your own thing. Mm -hmm. I don't. I mean, I don't know. There's there's a whole lot, of, you know, about that. And right now, I can't, you know, have that conversation. But we can have that conversation. Oh no, no, no. I, listen, I, from just from a business owner standpoint, I get it. You know what I'm saying? The time time is 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 one of my most valuable <laughs> assets. Yeah. It's just time. Yep. And so I understand wholeheartedly. I just didn't know from, mm -hmm. from your love of what you do. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Do you prefer the way you do it? Or, you know what I'm saying? Did you like uh, the private part? You know, I just didn't know because that's something we never really said. I love, I love all of it because yeah. each, each situation is different. And you know, like I tell everybody, you know, Allah blessed me with so many things because I came from humble beginnings. So where I'm at now. So I I get it, but it's just like I'm in I'm in a, I'm in a different place right now. I mean, I, but I love the work that I do. We we know that. <laughs> I love the work that I do, yeah. but I also love being me. And that's so that's important. You know what I mean? I, I take care of me. A lot of a lot of people in the mental health field, they don't take care of themselves. They become burnout. Mm -hmm. And they become a slave to the um to the therapy. Office. Because it, it can become consuming. Yeah. So I don't want that. Yeah. Because of the things that I've seen. I mean, there's a balance. Right. You know, sometimes, you know, when I gotta go, when I gotta grind, I pull my boots up and I do my thing. But when I say, okay, it's it's time for me, I shut the world off. I don't talk with you know I me. Mean? I when I shut it off, I shut it off. You be like, where is that? I ain't heard from him. He ain't been on social media. He ain't answered his phone. That type of situation. I have a, a question. Why sure. do you why do you think so many um and I'm gonna go with uh black people? Yeah. Um either don't or are hesitant about speaking with like therapist. Okay. 
That's a question that I was gonna do for this week, but but I'll do it right. I'll do it right now. Here's the thing with that. Think about this now. I want you to think about this. Mm-hmm. The reason why we don't go because what? People say, man, why are you going to talk to them people? You you crazy? You see what I'm saying? You know you know how we do it. You know how our people is. Mm-hmm. So that deters you. Be like, man, I can't go in there. You know, such and such said. You know, I've been. I gotta admit to them people that I'm crazy. They ain't gonna be to them people. They ain't gonna put me in no mental institution. You know what I'm saying? And it ain't. Even, it ain't even about that. You know what I mean? It ain't even about that. But you know how we are. Yeah. And yeah. then a lot of reason why we don't go in there because we don't see people that look like us. Mm. That's a big component. You know what I mean? They'll say, "Man, I ain't going there with them white folks and tell them I got problems." So they can say this and this about me. They're not gonna do that. They're not gonna do that. Now, since uh, when I worked in Connecticut, and since I've been here in Baltimore, I met a lot of therapists, but they're they're African American female. I ran into a little bit more males, but most of them are African American female. I met a lot of them. There's a lot of them in the in the um. In, in the organization where I work at, I met a lot of them. So, and there's not many, like I said, of me, but it's a lot of them. What's the, what's the um, percentage, if, if if you can give a number, um, from when you entered into this field into now, that you can say, the growth, is it 2%, 5%? It's not the growth, it's the location. Because hmm. when I was doing it in Massachusetts and Connecticut, I was the only one. Wow. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> so I went through a lot in Massachusetts and I was in Connecticut. I went through a lot. I was the only one. It was rare. You, you should see their faces when... They hear me talk on the phone. They hear their education. And when they, when I walk in that office with that suit and tie on, they were like, they look at the resume and look back at me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Wow. So, yeah. Wow. That's, that. that's important to know, though, because, like you said, it's, it's not so much as the mm-hmm. numbers, it's the locations. Yeah. And how do, how do, you, get, how do you get people comfortable or, um, yeah, I'm going to use comfortable. How do you get people comfortable understanding that it's okay to not be okay and seek, you know, therapy? I mean, you don't even have to, yeah, to seek help because you don't even really have to have like a mental illness just to talk to a therapist. Sometimes there may be times that you just want somebody to talk to. So how do you make people um you know, feel comfortable understanding. First, okay. first I, invite, I invite them into a safe space. You know what I mean? I don't put them in a position where there's, I put them between me and them. And I let them know before I even ask them their name, anything. Most likely I ask them their name and I'll just say, you know, I run it down to them. This is a safe space. My job is to have confidentiality it means that everything you tell me in this room stays with me. Mm-hmm. You understand what I'm saying? There's so many things that protect us. It's a lot of stuff. But once you come in the office and talk to me, it stays with me. I got a lot of secrets that I'm going to probably go, go back to the ground with. Yeah. The stuff that I know that I know. You know what I mean? I take confidentiality seriously. We at the NASW Code of Ethics. I'm bound by that. I take that very seriously. I read the Code of Ethics all the time to see if there's any changes. Mm-hmm. I take the Code of Ethics very seriously. I will protect my client at all costs because I'm not going to allow a child to be hurt because of me. When me and that child have a conversation, it stays with me. Right. You understand what I'm saying? And the only person, the only person that can... Get it out of me is a judge. Mm. So you can't go get a lawyer and call me and say, you know, don't work my way. I love it. You got to get a judge. 
then that's a whole nother thing too. But that but that that's that's big in the trust department. Absolutely. But like I said, I had great mentors, old heads that taught me the game, male and females, and they were Caucasian. Wow. You know what I mean? I had two Caucasian women at Boston College. They were the best. They told me, they said, Roy, you are a minority. There's a lot of things that you're going to go through, but I'm going to do my best to teach you how to deal with those things. And she did. You know what I mean? She taught me a lot. But they both did. They taught me a lot how to deal with that. And I had a mentor who was a white old head male. He taught me a lot of stuff. He took me under his wing. And he taught me a lot. And him and I talk to this day. He's in Massachusetts. Him and I, we text, email, phone call. We still talk. And if I run into a jam, I call him. <laughs> And call him, tell him, look, I got this problem. Okay, Roy. Then, he, then he'll say, you know, you know how you are, blah, blah, blah. And we do that. But at the end of the day, he, te he teaches me how to take care of myself. Wow. Mental, yeah. health, mental health is a beautiful thing. I love it. Never in the world. When I first went to college, I wanted to be a Fed. Wow. I wanted to be a U.S. Marshal. But when I started working with kids, started working with mental health, it's like a drug. So do you work with more youth than adults, or is it like an even balance? I've worked with everything, families, children. I've worked with children all ages, from babies. I've seen babies, too. I can tell you, I got so many in this brain. I've worked with babies. So, 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 were you in what they call a lot of progressions, or was there just fields that you were just interested in understanding? No, nah, just that I moved around. Today's, today's professionals, they're not committed anymore to staying at one place for a long time. They, okay. they, they build their resumes. Gotcha. And that's what I did. I learned from other people. I learned from my wife was an HR professional, taught me how to build my resume and make me marketable. And I moved around and I built my resume. I owe, I owe a lot of that to her. I built my resume to where when I put my resume on the table, you're not going to say I can't do it because I've done it. Not only am I had the education, I had the experience. Mm. That means you're not gonna bring me in and pay me minimal wages. You're not gonna do that. You're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna have to. Pay, you're gonna have to pay me. But like I said, it's it's not about the monetary, right? You know what I mean? It's about me giving back. Yeah. It's about about. it's about being blessed from yeah. where I came from. That's a big thing with me. I mean, most of the people that I grew up with, it came out of the situation I came from. They're incarcerated on drugs. They've given up on life. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? And look at where I am. And I haven't forgot that. I don't forget one day. So I'm here to help. And I was telling Madeline that when we were talking about this, I had no problem with it. Well, we we love it, man, because this this <laughs> is this has been a long time coming for us. Yeah, you know, I mean, I might sound a little arrogant, but. I knew my stuff. Oh no, not at all. Not you know, but you know why? You know, you know why? You know why? You know why I know you know why I know my stuff? Because they made me learn it. Yeah. Exactly. I, had be, I had to be twice as good. Yeah. Most definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so that's what I did. So yeah. Most definitely. And, and you know, we we knew that, you know, getting you on here would just be awesome. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It, yeah. it, this has just been so just fulfilling just to be able to share information mm -hmm. that can bless families, yep. that can bless individuals, yep. you know, and, and to see somebody that looks like you. That's true. You know, to see someone that looks like you, they they, they can relate to you, you know, because although you have a, a high level of education, mm -hmm. you can still talk 
the regular lingo. <laughs> <laughs> because education doesn't change me. No, exactly. Right. And so that, that, that was one of the things for me when, mm -hmm. when I when I want to introduce people, I want to introduce people that are not only well qualified to speak on what they're speaking on, but they're also relatable. I'm down to earth. I'm still the same old person. I do the same stuff, the same silly stuff. It, yeah, I'm just I'm just normal. I mean, but when I get in that other room and I gotta switch that role, I can do that. I can use the big words and all that too if I want to, but if there's no need, my mentor told me keep it simple. I love it. You know what I mean? He 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 told me, Roy, keep it simple. You ain't gotta use no large words because you already know what you know. Exactly. Keep, keep it simple. Because because exactly. talking to some of these people to gain to gain a therapeutic relationship, the big words is not gonna get them to trust you. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have to be able to have a simple conversation. Yeah. Yeah, you're gonna have to understand. You're gonna have to understand their struggles. Yeah, you understand what I'm saying. You're not gonna come in a room and think you're here and they're here. That's not gonna work. You're not gonna establish a therapeutic relationship with them. Never. They're not gonna say anything. They're gonna shut down. You're trying to open these people up. So you gotta make the the, the playing field level. And you got to be genuine because they can sense that. You can't be someone who's never been in a in a dysfunctional situation or you can't be a person that's never been humble. They they can see that. You can't come out and say, "Oh, I've been, you know, I understand the struggle." But you can't do that just to get a therapeutic relationship and not be genuine. They can they can tell. They can they can tell if you're genuine. And they'll shut down. Well, listen, we wow. we we're at the end of the Bro, right. yes, man, and listen, sweetheart, yeah. what do you well, think? <laughs> well, we already discussed um, this is more than a one part, so yeah. we really want you to break it down, and I know that more people have more questions. Yep. I'm open it up where they can send questions via email in case people, you know, were didn't yep. really want to put certain questions in the chat box. Yep. So um, I know that um, your wife will be on uh, is it either next Tuesday or the Tuesday after? I, I don't can't know. To schedule which one she's on, but okay. uh, we'll do a part two on this um, yep. either the Tuesday before her or the Tuesday. You just let me know your schedule, but I'm we good. just want to get open. it. I'm open. You just let me know. Okay, that'll work. That'll work. So we want to thank everyone for tuning in to In the Blender with Brandon and Madeline Hyman. And if you have any questions, or comments, please send us an email to weareablendedfamily at gmail.com. And you can tune into this broadcast, the replay of it anytime on Facebook. You can also go to our YouTube channel in the Blender and also on all of the other social media outlets. You can find the broadcast there as well. And other than that, brother, we just want to thank you again for coming and sharing with the people. Um, I pray that um, what you said touched somebody on tonight, which I know that it did. Okay. Um, but again, I really I appreciate you. We yes. appreciate yes. you. Until okay. next time, everyone have a good night and stay blessed. Love you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. You're welcome.